Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My exchange family from all over the world, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-host, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zars. How y'all doing, ladies? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing great. I'm, I'm currently here um, in San Antonio, Texas at the Fort Sam Houston store. They always take care of me. But the thing is, they put me in this room where the this automatic lights, and then all of a sudden the lights go off, and then it looks like it's a disco ball. So if y'all see the disco ball come out, <laughs> just know I got to get up and wave around. And uh, we'll be seeing some dances get, get from going. Chief today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but no, we got an awesome awesome guest today. And uh, without further ado, Emily, please introduce today's guest. Today's guest is a decorated Marine who served in Afghanistan for 16 months. He was awarded a Purple Heart after he and others were ambushed in a field on November 9th, 2010. He currently teaches English literature at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. I always stumble on that one, my apologies, Annapolis, Maryland, where he remains on active duty. Today, he joins us to discuss his new book, Always Faithful, available tax-free at shopmyexchange.com. Please give a warm chief chat welcome to Major Tom Schumann. Hey. Hey, sir, how you doing? Hey, good. Happy to be here. How you doing? I'm doing great. And, and, and from one former Marine to a current Marine, I just want to give you a, a big oorah. Yeah, once Marine, always a Marine, except for five. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. But my Marine buddies always give me crap because I'm in the Air Force now. So uh, they, well, they, they remind me that. of all the, yeah, exactly. But I wouldn't expect anything less from them. Yeah. Ra? So can, can you let our viewers know where you're coming to us from? Yeah, I, I think uh, I've actually wrapped up teaching at the Naval Academy. I subsequently spent a year at the Naval War College up there in um, – Newport, Rhode Island. I got a uh, got to study there, and then uh, I'm 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 the operations officer for Third Battalion, Fifth Marines, out in Camp Pendleton, California. So I live just uh, north of base here in San Clemente. Awesome, and we'd like to thank you for sharing such an inspiring story of sacrifice and friendship. Taking it back to the very beginning, though, what influenced your decision to join the military? Sure, I wasn't. Uh... Yeah, I didn't grow up GI Joe. I didn't, you know, I, I, I just finished teaching at the Naval Academy where every midshipman had, I shouldn't say every, many of the midshipmen have a long family tradition of, of service that, that wasn't really me. It wasn't what I grew up knowing. I, I hadn't, I did not watch apocalypse now or platoon. I wasn't watching, you know, war movies or anything like that as a kid. Uh, I, I, what I was kind of, you know, listening to the doors and grateful dad, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't in my wheelhouse, um, as a teenager, but, uh, nine 11 happened. I was in high school as a sophomore. And by the end of that day, I knew I would do something. Uh, it was the first time it was the end of the age of innocence or maybe the age of ignorance, whichever you like to call it. It was the first time for me that I said, Oh, there's people in this world that don't like our liberties and freedoms. And then there's people in this world that preserve those liberties and freedoms. And, and so somebody has to do that. Uh, they're under attack. You should do it. And, and that was my first inclination towards services that you should contribute into this thing. You should be the person that helps preserve this stuff. And, uh, and so on that day, I made a decision to serve. I probably couldn't have told you the four branches of military service. Uh, I, I had no idea what I want to do, or, 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 but I, I knew I wanted to serve. And so, you know, my, my journey to, towards being a Marine infantryman is really me stumbling along the way until finally kind of stumbling into what I feel like is actually, I, I, I landed in the right place. Uh, the Marine infantry is definitely for me, but um, it was a, it was definitely a lot of discovery along the way. 
So without the brave choice of joining the military and many other brave choices to follow, we wouldn't have Always Faithful. Co-written with Afghan interpreter Zainal Zaki, you take readers on an unforgettable journey through both your experiences during the war in Afghanistan. So what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, there's so many heroes in, in my journey that I wanted to be able to highlight, you know, starting with my mom. And so when we talk about ideas of you know, what, what inspired me to serve, it's for me, there's it's, it's bifurcation between 9-11 and my mom. And my mom uh, was a single mom raising two kids. She's a Chicago cop. And she answered a calling and, uh, and, and she made a significant amount of sacrifice to provide opportunities for my sister and I that she had never dreamed of for herself. And uh, for her to be able to provide those opportunities, opportunities that she could have never imagined, uh, I think that's something special. And, and I think that um, America is like a bank that that you, somebody's got to make deposits into that. Somebody's got to someone's got to contribute. Uh, everyone can't just kind of take from this. And so uh, my mom, you know, really inspired me in a lot of ways uh, through her own example of, of service. And so uh, I felt the civic duty uh, shaped by my mom. And so that, you know, wh why did I write? I want, I want to talk about some of my heroes uh, starting w with my mom. And then uh, I spent 17 months ish in, in Afghanistan. And there's a whole host of uh, 18 to 22 year olds who really did some of the most incredibly brave, things, uh, you know, that, you, that any, any person could imagine. And, and I thought, uh, their stories are worth knowing there. And, 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 you know, that's first platoon right there and their stories are worth knowing. And then uh, I, the opportunity to write it with Zach, I thought was really important because America spent 20 years and there's Zach. And so America spent 20 years in, in this country and we've invested trillions of dollars and maybe that maybe the American public is interested in knowing a little bit more about this country Afghanistan that we spent so much time talking about and I think Zach provides a unique perspective in that he was born there he was raised there uh, he spent his entire life there and so rather than just me talking about uh, a year and a half of my time in, in a country wh why not bring in a guy who uh, spent his whole life there to tell us a little bit about this uh, country Afghanistan so that, that's a little bit about what, what inspired us to read it or write it well, no, that's a that's an awesome story, and and you you brought up you know some some awesome points about you know paying tribute to your mother, then paying tribute to the the men and women that you serve with, and then paying tribute to to uh, uh, supporters of of, of the, that mission uh, in Afghanistan, and um because you mentioned eighteen to twenty one year old, twenty two year olds that that are doing some incredible things out there. Uh, people always ask me during these interviews, like which which one is your favorite interview? And I got a chance to uh, interview a, a couple of Medal Medal of Honor recipients, and and just hearing their story and what they went through, and you hear that they were 18, 19, 20 years old when it happened. It's just you know it's amazing to even fathom because you know I have a 22 year old and and the, to think that he could even maneuver in that situation, um, it, it just kind of baffles me. But I know that we are trained to to be put in that situation. And when we're in that situation, you, you don't think it's instinct. So you just go off of instinct and training and then uh, and, and hopefully good things happen. So uh, thanks for, you know, put, you know, memorializing all those people in, the, in your book. Yeah. And, and one, of, one of them that is featured heavily is um, Art of Benagua. And much of what we do is is instinctual. It's it's it is your immediate action to the training. Uh, and, and then there are some conscious choices that I think are worth highlighting. And, and so Arden Benagua was a combat engineer and the combat engineers at the time walked out in front of the patrol. And so where we, where we were fighting and staying in Afghanistan, there was mines everywhere, IEDs and provide explosive device. And so the biggest threat, uh, although we were in regular firefights, so really the biggest threat was this IED threat. And so what we would do is we would patrol in single file lines. And the person who walked front would sweep through this minefield with a metal detector. But the issue was that the IEDs did not give off metallic signatures. So you, you, you're, you're patrolling through the minefield and really you're proofing it with your feet and your eyes. And, and this, and this Marine Artem Benago 
he was the 12th casualty of 13 in his combat engineer squad. And so every day he went out, it was a conscious choice that he was 19. He turned 19 mm -hmm. while we were there. And, and, and every day he went out knowing that it wasn't a matter of if, but when. That, that when, you're, when, when your entire squad of engineers is killed or missing limbs, 11 of them have, and you're number 12, it's, it's, it's these 19 year old kids who still go anyways. It's these 19 year old kids who accept incredible responsibility. And, and, and Artem Benagua, you know, never turned to me once and said, Hey, sir, can, can someone else do this today? Can someone else? No, knowing, knowing the consequence, knowing his fate ahead of time, he still grabbed his rifle, grabbed his pack and, and walked to the front of the patrol each day up until the point that he was ultimately killed in action. And, and that's why I named my, my, my last son uh, after him. And so, yeah, the, the, the opportunity to, to memorialize, like you said, some of these young, young men and, and women, I think uh, was, was really important to me. That's awesome. And uh, like I said, it's, it, it brings, it, it raises the hair on the back of your neck whenever you tell stories like that. So uh, we appreciate that. And uh, you also uh, talked about your bond with, with Zach. And so uh, can you, can you kind of give us one of your most memorable moments with him? Sure. I mean, our interpreters are important in, in so much as that it's how we communicate with the local populace and much of what we do is we're, we're talking to the local people trying to provide security and um so there's that part of what a, what an interpreter does is is like literal translation uh and that's what most interpreters do and that's fine like that's their job they translate and so there, there's but but zach was so much more than just someone who translated for us he helped us understand the the cultural nuances uh how to act within the villages he would help us cue in on some uh cultural um protocols that we might not understand uh normally but really the maybe the most memorable one of many but where zach went from more than like just a person who worked for first platoon and became part of first platoon is is we were headed into a village and like i said we would patrol through these minefields and so it, it'd be single file it'd be very slow and the person up front you can't ask this 18 year old kid to walk faster through the minefield when they're basically trying to look for the mines with their eyes and in their feet. And so, uh, Zach hears the Taliban call and say, Hey, initiate the ambush, initiate the ambush, get set up for the ambush. And he tells me, sir, you got to hurry up. They're, they're about to start the ambush. And I'm like, I can't make this guy walk any faster than he is, you know? And he says, by the time you guys get to the village, they're already going to be in position. And I said, Zach, I can't, uh, we're doing our best. And he said, I got to go. And he just took off through this unswept minefield where we knew there were several other IEDs. He runs through there. He knew what compound they were coordinating from, goes in there, tackles the Taliban commander, detains them and waits for us to come up. And so he, the risks wow. that he took were incredible and, and, and he really fought and bled alongside us. And it was, it was at that point that it was clear that he, he wasn't just someone who, who translated for first platoon. He was really part of first platoon that's an incredible story and in the book you mentioned that the fighting at singen wore the marines down but broke the taliban will to go head to head with us you also mentioned that all marine infantrymen have a fear of missing out Having spent more than a year in Afghanistan, what were your biggest lessons learned from being in combat? Yeah, be careful what you ask for. So, you know, <laughs> you, you've got the you've got the fear of missing out, but uh there's also uh significant consequences of of being part of it. Uh ultimately, I am grateful for the adversity of combat. Ultimately, combat taught me a lesson uh in 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 minutes and days that would take uh you know maybe decades to learn so i think ta combat is such a great teacher it helped me mature from being a, a boy to a man and uh i was refined my character was refined under fire i learned about brotherhood and friendship and love all in combat and so uh i i think ultimately i am very grateful for the hardship of uh and the heat of that battle um because it it you know you you're only stronger when you go into fire and so 
I, there, there are many lessons to, to, to be learned, but, but really it's, it's combat, you know, all of life has little glimpses of heaven and hell. And then combat is just that magnified. It's just, it's just those little glimpses of heaven and hell on a magnitude uh, and a scale that is, is unique. And so it, it's, it's, you see the waste and the, and, and the horror, but then you see acts of love, like somebody running through machine gun fire to help their friend and, and, you know, or someone sacrificing their life for somebody else. And it's these, it's, it's these, you know, no greater love. It's these expressions of love that you get to see uh, unfold on the battlefield that are, um, it's, it's these lessons manifested to the highest degree. And, and, and uh, I'm just um, thankful for the opportunity to have been a, a witness to, to some of uh, these lessons. Wow. So your hardships, those challenges and those lessons all afforded you a purple heart. Um, so in your book, you provide such detailed accounts, allowing readers to visualize the scene of the trench Marine who didn't have any sleeping clothes, um, but also it allows readers to lament the loss of those closest to you. So what emotions were you going through when you were writing the book and what do you hope that readers take away from the story? Sure. It, it is um, emotionally fatiguing to go through some of these experiences. Uh, it also, you know, rather than running from things, I think it's good to face them. And writing allows you to face something because you have the power of the pen in your hand. And when you have the power of the pen, you, you, you get uh, some agency and some autonomy over that experience and, and, and you become less of a victim of that experience. And so I think there's that that, that is, uh, important to acknowledge as well is that writing really helps you make meaning of these experiences it allows you to interrogate and, and decipher some of the feelings that, that you had and and so uh in many ways it, it can be cathartic um what what this the story at its core you know what do you what do what i want people to take away is you know the story at its core is about friendship it's about keeping promises uh some of that is captured in a war setting as as you mentioned and 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 to me, the you know the Marine, you know the Marine Corps has this motto of semper fidelis, which which translates to always faithful, and 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 it's easy to be always faithful some of the time. I think most people can be mostly faithful. It's actually not that challenging to be mostly faithful most of the time, but for it to be always faithful, for it to be more than a bumper sticker or just a, a, something that we say cheaply. It means that that you have to put the emphasis on the always or the semper. And and to be, I think it is unique and rare for someone to be 100% faithful 100% of the time. But that's what we're called to do, to make it an ethos, to make it a lifestyle. And so uh, I, I think if we make a promise to our allies or make a promise to our friends uh, in our relationships, in, in all that we do, we have to live that ethos. And so the book is, is, is about... Uh, you know, our attempts to live uh, what it actually means to be always faithful. So, sir, I, you know, my question is, uh, are you are you an avid writer or do you, do you uh, use writing as therapy or do you use other means to kind of, you know, to, to cope with with what you've been through in um, Sure. I, I think, you know, uh, it's a combined arms effect as we like to use in the Marine Corps. I think uh, writing is one of those things. Uh, uh, in 2018, I went to a, a, a English graduate program at Georgetown. And uh, up until then, I never had the time to really unpack a lot of this experience. Or at least I told myself that. I, I, I think I, I was lying to myself when I said I was too busy. I, I was busy, but I think I didn't have the moral courage to actually look inside that sea bag, you know, to me, physical courage is always very easy because you've, you're just not thinking about yourself. You say, Oh, I got my friend is in a bad position. I got to go help my friend. And, you know, with my faith to me, I could be killed. And it's like, well, that's just a transition. So it's no problem. And so physical courage for me on the battlefield was always very easy, but uh, having the moral courage to interrogate why some of my behavior, which was at times destructive, or unhealthy like that to, to dig into that what was uh i was afraid to to go there uh writing uh 
helped me start to make that meaning. And, and I started that when I was at that Georgetown graduate program. And then I had two years at the Naval Academy to teach where I did a bunch of writing. And so writing has definitely been cathartic. I think, um, you know, when you're talking about being mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally healthy, uh, writing is a tool you know, lifting weights is important. Getting outside is important. Uh, I, I think, you know, I, I, I always talk about, when we talk about casualties, uh, we, we put casualties as routine priority or urgent casualties. And so that means self-aid, buddy aid, or corpsman aid. And, and so, mm -hmm. uh, and so if, 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 if what you're, we, and, and we do, what we do in the military is we really do a great job of teaching people how to treat their physical wounds. If you've got a if you got a gunshot wound to the arm, we say like here you got to put a tourniquet on it, right? If you got a sucking mm -hmm. chest wound, we say oh you got to go to the you got to go to the surgeon. To, and what we don't talk about are invisible wounds, and 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 how to assess those and how to treat those. And so if you're just having a bad day, maybe you just need to go out for a walk. Maybe you need a journal, and 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 maybe you can just self recover. Uh, maybe you're having a bad day and, and, and you try some of those things and you, you, have to, you have to call a friend and say, Hey, I'm, you know, this is how I'm feeling today. And maybe that, maybe that, maybe they can fireman carry you out of that. Uh, but maybe some days you, you, you call a friend, you go for the walk, you do the writing and, and you're still bleeding. And, mm -hmm. uh, just like you, you wouldn't try to treat a sucking chest wound yourself. If you got a gunshot wound to the chest, you wouldn't say, well, I, I, I got a little medical training. I could probably just take care of this sucking chest. When you'd say, no, I, I want to go to the doctor. Like I need, mm -hmm. I need to see doc. I need, I need to see someone who's trained to, to, to treat this wound. What we'll do is that, you know, we'll have an invisible wound of the same magnitude, uh, as, as corrosive to our health as, as the physical wound. And, and we, and we'll just try to self medicate it. And, uh, and, and, and the issue is that like, you're not the only casualty in this situation that, that you are bleeding in, into your friends and your family. And, and so, uh, you gotta, there's a, the, the, there's, there's, you gotta go get help. And, uh, for me, that took a long time to, to acknowledge that. But, uh, you know, so when you talk about, is this, you know, is this your therapy or is this like my therapy is my therapy. Uh, writing is one of the tools that I help with my own kind of mental health as well. But um, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, where am I at and do I need to do I need to see somebody professionally that that deals with this? Like just like if you were going to do like a heart transplant, you wouldn't be like uh, you got a like a sewing kit to your buddy. Like we could yeah, you, yeah. you'd want to go to the card. You want to go to the cardiologist uh, like that's who you want to do your heart transplant. And, and so uh if, if you got something going on mentally emotionally you, you pro probably go to the doctor who deals with that kind of stuff well yeah i appreciate you you saying that because it's, it's always important to have leaders actually admit that they're they're going to seek help and and they're because uh, i think sometimes as leaders we're, we're good at, at at pushing people to get help uh without even having to experience ourselves and so uh I'm, I'm glad you were able to kind of you know bring that home that yeah that writing is a tool, but, you know, I, I'm actually, you know, talking to professionals to, to get some assistance and just, and, and get out of the stigma, the military, you know, in, in my, you know, experience, you know, they've had a stigma about, uh, you know, mental health, uh, and people getting their careers taken away and, and all kind of other stuff that, that I, I've heard out there in my, in my time. And it's just, it's, it's important to take care of you. Uh, and if you're not a hundred percent, then, it's hard to pour into anybody else if you you got some stuff going on. So uh, I always advise anybody listening, uh, if you need help, you know, raise your hand and, and get some help because um, you know it's 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 a tough world out there, and and we we need help. We all need somebody. But so also you uh, you find time to give back to veterans, uh, and so uh, why is it so important that you support those who have who I've already served before you? Sure, I I founded uh, Patrol Base Abate, named after one of my snipers who was killed on December second, and he was uh, posthumously awarded the Navy Cross. And after I had a whole, uh, I had a number of Marines commit suicide. One was particularly tough. Uh, Corporal Justin McLeod, a, a Marine I convinced to extend for that deployment who had a young son. And uh, the wounds from the battlefield 
well, he didn't succumb to them on the day that he was injured. He did succumb to them, you know, a decade later. And I started to read the VA suicide reports and all the data that was out there. And what I, what I kept finding is that the data was saying that the leading proximal cause to, to veteran suicide are feelings of disconnectedness and isolation. And I said, okay, what organizations are out there that are getting people connected and in community? If, if we know that's the protective layer. And, 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 but, but there's one interesting statistic that I found that I think not many people are tracking is that uh, non-combat veterans uh, are twice as likely to commit suicide and that there's no correlation between combat and suicide. And so everybody would, everybody finds that statistic surprising. I don't in that I, I think, you know, you, you've, you know, chief, you spent oh, 20 years, you know, over 20 years as part of a tribe. You've for, for, for over two decades, you've had a purpose, a mission, you know, a mission is a task and a purpose. And so whether you're, you're on a C-17, whether you're a motor T, whether your communication doesn't, irrespective of what uh, branch of service or community you're in, you've, everybody has signed a check. And we, and we would say, I would die for you. And if you look back historically in World War II, everybody got an opportunity to die for the country. The cooks, the, the, the clerks, everybody. You know, and in World War III, everybody, again, whatever community you're in, you're going to have an opportunity to die for your country. And so the, 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 to be a part of a team where everybody would die for one another and then, and then to have a no kidding purpose. So if I'm a communications uh, specialist, I know it's important for the infantry Marine to be able to talk. Like if I can't talk, I can't get fire support. I can't do a medevac. I can't request resupplies. If I'm motor T and I'm driving a truck, like I know, Hey, these grunts, they need their bullets, their, 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 their chow, their water. Like we can, we can go to any, you, you can go to any community, any specialty and see how it supports the overall mission. Well, then when you transition, You've been indoctrinated into uh, this this community where where, where you're issued uh, a tribe and you're given a mission, and now and then you there's no indoctrination out of the military, and and so then you 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 find yourself in a in a society that's increasingly isolated or insulated, and 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 so it's it's hard to create that tribe again, and and it's hard to find that purpose again. And so what I wanted to do was was create a space where if you served, you're eligible to, to join us. And so what, what I found is many of these other veteran service organizations are great, but they have a lot of hoops to jump through. They have a lot of boxes to check. You gotta be disabled, disordered, combat, special forces, wounded, you know, and it's like all these ways to exclude you from having the community, from having their services, or they were reactive, right a bang. You had to have had a, a overdose or attempt. And so, now we'll provide you these services. And I said, hey, let's get proactive, preemptive, uh, and, and let's open this up to active duty, National Guard, reservists, veterans. Uh, and, and, and the only requirement is that you raise your right hand so that the PFC, who's a general, uh, if you raise your right hand and service your country, you're in. That's it. No, no additional requirements, no additional hoops, no additional boxes. And then I said, uh, and, then, and we're going to do what you're into. So what are you, what are you into? books, jujitsu, weightlifting, golf, uh, scuba diving, uh, surfing, whatever. I'm not going to make it the Tom Schumann club that I, I, I'm a literature guy. You know, I teach literature. I like books and I'm a grunt. So I walk around outside. Like those are my hobbies, but I don't want to make it just what, you know, so many of these organizations are fly fishing organizations. And I think that's cool. Uh, not everybody is into, and so we got to make it what, what you're into and then we can make it free of cost. So, it's, so you can't say like, well, I, I would do that thing, but you guys aren't into the, it's like, well, what are you into? Do you want to lead it? Let's make a club and then we'll resource you and we'll build a club around. And so we've got a fight club, a strength club, a jujitsu club. We, we, we've got a yoga club that just went up. We got a music club. And so we got this space up in Montana, 350 acre ranch where we say, Hey, we're doing the thing that you're into. We're doing it with the people that you can trust that, that, that speak a common language. Uh, and, and we're going to fly you out, pick you up, feed you for the weekend, uh, on a side of a mountain in Montana in the most beautiful place in the world. And, and initially many service members and veterans were like, well, I was just a, uh, I was just an air force, uh, data analyst. And I'm like, okay, we built the patrol base for you. We built this, we built this organization 
literally for you. And it's like, and people were shocked. Like, well, and, and so what I've had to do is I've had to fight this narrative of I'm just, and to me, uh, all service matters. There is no, I was just a, or I'm just a, it's, it's, you're not special because you serve, but it service matters. And we, and we, we recognize that you served, you're in, there's no, I'm just, and, uh, and, and we built a very inclusive, accessible space for, uh, everybody who's ever raised the right hand. And, 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 um, we've been doing it for two years now and, uh, bringing folks out for the weekend to our return to base program up there. And it is, uh, changing lives undoubtedly. Yes, sir. Okay. And can you, can you plug your, that, that organization for, for our viewers? It's called yeah. Patrol Base Abate, uh, named after my sniper. And, and, you know, part of our mission is to honor his legacy. Uh, so you can go to pbabate.org or look us up on Instagram at pbabate. Uh, and if you want to see some of our programs in action, you can go on YouTube and search uh, pbabate. And you can kind of see uh, what we're doing up there in the mountains, whether it's music, uh, literature, uh, jujitsu. It's, it's, there's some good videos, too. Awesome. And you are getting incredible reception on our live feed right now. So I wanted to turn really quickly to our comments um, and read uh, just a couple um, that we're getting. So Chica, thanks you so much for your service. Um, and you too, Chief. She thanks you as well. Um, and we have so many coming in and saying hello. Marisa said, love hearing Major Schumann talk about the importance of the written word for storytelling, for healing, for memorializing memorializing i am stumbling on my words today i do apologize and for honoring and um we have everyone in here just saying it's amazing your stories are very moving and um they can't wait to pick up your book we do have one question from mike um what advice would you give someone considering joining the military i, I you know i think when i taught at the naval academy um I never, I never encourage any, any of my students necessarily to be a Marine. You know, I, I think, uh, if you want it, if you want the challenge, uh, you should come get it. And, and, and I can tell you that, um, I have found immense purpose, immense community. Uh, this, this job is professionally rewarding. It's challenging. There's high standards, uh, it's for me for sure. And, and I'm 14 years in and, and I'm thankful for every moment that I've had in uniform. Uh, but it, it's, it's up to you. Are, are you looking to be challenged? Are you looking to be held to high standards? Do you want to be held accountable? Do you want to be a part uh, of, of something bigger than yourself? If that's what you're interested in then come try out. Uh, and, and so, uh, it's, it's always got to be up to the individual, you know, I, cause I could, I could convince any midshipman at the Naval Academy, that they want to be a Marine. I can, I, I'm persuasive. I'm influential. I can, I can inspire you in the moment, but I'm not going to be there on those long hikes. I'm not going to be there on these long nights. Like you've got to want it for yourself. So that's why I never try to persuade or coerce anybody into it. It's like, Hey, you've got to want it deep down because there's, it's, it's too tough of a job uh, to do it for external factors. You, you, you can only do this if you internally uh, have that fire, that passion, that desire. Thank you. So Major Schumann, as you already know, American troops left Afghanistan last August, ending the longest war. As a leader who fought in the war, how did it feel to witness this? And what are your hopes for our Afghan allies, including Zaki? It was undoubtedly tough. You know, if I'm honest, uh, there was some moral injury in, in, in watching how that unfolded. It's something that we were told we were winning. It's something that we were told uh, that we were committed to, uh, you know, I remember a time where I was drowning in, in the Hellman river there, I was trying to cross the river and I, I went under and I quite literally debated whether it would be better for me to ditch my gear, meaning I would not have accountability for all my equipment, uh, or if it would be better for me to keep it on, be accounted for and drown. Like that's, that's the Marine Corps, how we're indoctrinated that, that, you know, your rifle, that, that accountability is that you never lose anything, that you never give away anything that you never. And then, uh, to see that we, we, I think we were, we think we lost some gear maybe. Uh, and so, uh, it, 
it was it was tough. Uh, there was a lot of anger um, to watch that. Now, the, you know, these kind of strategic conversations are ab above my pay grade. Um, all, all I know is that at the tactical level, uh, we went where we were sent, we fought, we bled, and we won the battles that we were asked to. And so that, that's what soldiers, airmen, Marines, and sailors would have always done. We go where our nation sends us and we fight and we win. And, and, and when you look at the airport at last year, at the fall of the airport, there were young men and women holding the line, showing that there's no better friend uh, and, and keeping our promises all the way up until the, up until the end of that war. And so, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, we, 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 we're going to need, every, everybody agrees at all levels that it's important to have allies. If you're gonna have allies, you gotta keep your promises. And, and that's, and that's what I would uh, offer on that. Gotcha. So, um, so can, like I said, your book sounds, your book is a very compelling story. I'm just wondering if people can expect to see a film in the future on, on it. Well, uh, if it, if it's compelling, we need to get it in the other exchanges. Uh, Cause I oh, know yeah. the Marine Corps PX, the PX, so I'm calling you out chief, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the it's, it's in all the Marine PXs, uh, but this is a story that highlights uh, Navy corpsmen and, and, and my time at the Naval Academy. This is a story that highlights uh, an Air Force officer who is the one with the, his fellow PJs. They pull, he's a pilot and, and his PJs pull my interpreter through the gate there at, at Kabul. So it, it is a, uh, it is a inner service, uh, all service book talking about uh, what, what each community is, is doing. So we want to see it get into the, 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 the Navy exchange and the, uh, and the Army and Air Force exchanges. Uh, so we'll just put that little plug in. Uh, and okay. yeah, it, it, <laughs> and, and in terms of um, it being a, a movie, so uh, there is a screen, the, the guy who wrote Save It Private Ryan in the, in the movie The Patriot, uh, his name is Bob Rodap he wrote the screenplay for it and uh there's two producers who uh, are going to produce it and so i think they're looking at this point they're uh working through some directors and so uh yeah they may uh, you know the guy who wrote the most famous war movie of all time has wrote, uh, wrote the screenplay uh for this story as well uh i think that bodes well uh and so yeah. uh hopefully um we can continue to tell the story of the young uh, brave men and women and of our Afghan partners. And, uh, maybe someday you'll see on the big screen. So, so, uh, if you're going to be in the movie, who, who would you want to play yourself? Yeah. Uh, I, re I don't like watch a lot of movies or TV. Uh, I know I read books mostly, but, uh, I, that's what everyone, all I said, all I told the producer is, is, uh, is, you know, I'm six, three. I just said, it can't be somebody short. It can't be, you know, all these action <laughs> heroes are these like, Matt Damon, Tom Cruise, they're all, you know, five, five and under. And yeah. I said, I don't care who you pick. Just it's got to be a somebody tall. Uh, that's my only request. Gotcha. We'll get Shaq on it. We just had him on the show. <laughs> yeah. so we'll <laughs> uh, take it. That, that should be my platoon sergeant, actually. We call him Black <laughs> Jesus. We got to get, uh, we got to get, uh, it should be my platoon sergeant. That's awesome. And before we say goodbye, may you please remind our viewers where they can go to follow you and keep up with everything Major Tom Schumann. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty active on, on Instagram at killzone, K-I-L-L dot Z zero and three. Um, it, it's, it's, it was part of, I talk about ambushes and that, that everybody in life ends up in the kill zone. Everybody gets, it, it's not exclusive to just the United States Marine or the soldier or the sailor or the airman that everybody has that ambush that they weren't expecting and, and that traumatic thing happens. And, and so I wanted to talk about how do, how can we be resilient in those moments and how can we start to recover and get out of the, from those ambushes? Because that unexpected car crash, cancer diagnosis, you know, it, it's, it's that ambush comes to us all at some point. So I wanted to kind of take some of the lessons that I've learned in terms of being resilient and, 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 and how I pathways I've took towards recovery. And so I started this page kill zone, um, when I was at Georgetown and it's, 
evolved into a leadership and literature and all kinds of wherever I'm, I'm and, and so that's where you can uh that's where i'm probably most active um and then i, I hope everybody checks out pb abate and and if, if you serve uh just know that we've built this space for you and, and we hope to see you out there at some point And as a reminder, authorized shoppers can purchase Always Faithful tax-free at shopmyexchange.com or visit your local exchange store to see if it's in stock there as well. Also, and, and, and for our Chief Chat viewers, you can view this episode uh, on YouTube and Spotify. You can rewatch with your friends or you can catch up with past episodes. Also, be sure to join us back at 2 p.m. Central on August 23rd when Jamie Foxx joins the chat. Uh, so mark your calendars for that. And then uh, 11 a.m. Central on September 1st when uh, Binga, a king, oh man, okay, a Kingwe, uh, who was in the wire and is currently on the old man will be on the show. So, sir, uh, we really appreciate yeah, that that yeah that last name it tripped me all the way up, you know, but I'm good now. I'm, I'm I got my bearing back. So but back there, in sir, the fight. Thank you. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your story and uh, giving us you know kind of clips of the book so people can go out there and, and grab it, grab it. I think you just, you wrapped up so many nuggets uh, and, and dropped them kind of strategically throughout this whole podcast uh, on, on resiliency and, and just we're in the people business. So I know we have mission and I, I understand we got, we doing this, but uh, everything revolves around, around people and, and, and how we can get the best out of anyone uh, that, that, you know, their, that their family trust, trust the military to, to send their child into uh, into the military, and we, we take care of them as leaders. So, uh, thank you for just dropping those jewels uh, for folks to, to kind of re resonate with them and, and, and kind of apply to their lives. Chief team, thanks for having me, Semper Fi. Absolutely. And so, sir, um, if you don't mind staying on uh, after the live, so we can kind of say our formal goodbyes. But um, uh, thank you again, and uh, wish you all the best. And uh, Chief, chat out.